In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Team Grace, today we conclude the Easter season and our formal celebration of the Lord's resurrection from the dead. We conclude the season with the high feast day of Pentecost, the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles and Our Lady. And Pentecost has always been very dear to my heart. Even when I was a young Christian, I didn't know. I always got excited about Pentecost. It's shocking that there are a lot of Christians who don't even know what Pentecost is. But I loved Pentecost. In fact, when I was a student priest in Rome, I made sure I always went to the Pantheon, because the Pantheon is the temple with a big hole in it. And in Rome, they drop all these red roses from the top while they're singing, Come Holy Spirit. It sounds very dramatic, very Italian, doesn't it? And I thought, oh, what is this? As an Irishman, I'm like, why do we do this? This is kind of stupid, right? <laughs> and then I went there the first time. I'm standing there, and all the roses are falling in red, and the sunlight's hitting the roses, and it's gleaming, and they're, Come Holy Spirit, Veni Creator. And I'm sitting I'm getting all emotional, right? <laughs> You know, and I thought, this is awesome. This is the Catholic faith, right? A way to celebrate, to commemorate the fact that the Holy Spirit has come upon the apostles and Our Lady and upon each of us at baptism and confirmation. We celebrate today the birthday of the church when we were awakened by the Spirit 50 days after our Lord's Passover, 50 days after his resurrection. Now, the feast is actually found in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is called the Feast of Pentecost, also known as the Festival of Weeks, so in the Jewish custom, they would track it by weeks, seven weeks, the Feast of Weeks. It was the harvest feast. It was also 50 days after the original Passover. God liberates his people from Egypt. 50 days later at Mount Sinai, he gives them the covenant. That's when we received the Ten Commandments. So there's a liberation. 50 days later, a covenant, a ratification of a covenant. That was the Old Testament. And that action in the Old Testament points to us what Jesus does in the New Testament that by his passion, death, and resurrection, the Lord's Paschal mystery, he has liberated us from sin and death. Fifty days later, in the very upper room where he initiated his passion, there where he celebrated the Last Supper, the first Mass, in that same spot, he sends the Holy Spirit. He ratifies, 50 days later, the covenant. The Jewish custom, festival of weeks. The Christian custom, we track it by days, not weeks. Pentecost, the word is Greek. It literally means the 50th as in the 50th day. 50 days after the Lord's resurrection, the Holy Spirit comes, the covenant that he has given to us is ratified. And in this way, it becomes our birthday. We are now established as the body of Christ, as the continuation of his work here in this life. The overlay between the Old Testament and New Testament shows us the unity of the two and places the Old Testament in its context as the one, the source of preparation for us for the coming of the Messiah and his saving work. What was done in the Old Covenant is now fulfilled in a spectacular way in the Messiah and Jesus of Nazareth. And on Pentecost, the new Pentecost, the Holy Spirit coming as a gush of wind and tongues of fire fell upon the apostles and Our Lady. And our baptism and our confirmation, that same Holy Spirit fell upon each one of us which is why many of you are wearing red today, an indication of the spirit that dwells within you. The apostles were emboldened on that first Pentecost. And St. Peter, as the chief apostle, we could say our first pope, stood and preached the gospel. By his preaching, thousands were converted to the Lord Jesus. Thousands chose to accept the gospel on that first Pentecost day. For this reason, again, we are, it is called the birthday of the church, not simply because we were awakened, but because we actually had a church. Not simply the apostles and Our Lady, but those thousands of converts that now began to be the church. So today is our birthday, Team Grace. It's a reminder to each one of us that we have a place, a role, within the saving work of Jesus Christ. Such a summon leads us back to our homily series for this Easter season. Over the past several weeks, we have reviewed the way of the Lord Jesus, the sacraments and our discipleship, the different vocations within the life of the church, our understanding of marriage and sexuality, our summons to holy fellowship, and our call to prayer. We have addressed each one of these. As we conclude this series, it's helpful for us to address how, as Christians, do we interact with the world. If we are called to go in the midst of the world, how is this to look? What is supposed to, what is this supposed to look like? What is this supposed to be? As Christians, we are called to go into the world, to be salt, light, and leaven. We are called to live in the midst of the world, but remain faithful to the way of the Lord Jesus. And that is very difficult, Team Grace. I'm sure many of you know in your own discipleship 
to be in the midst of the world, all its ideologies, all of its perspectives, everything, and yet remain faithful to the way of the Lord Jesus. I hope that's not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's got something to say, all right? <laughs> a gush of wind, a cell phone, it happens, right? But what does it look like that we're in the midst of the fallen world and yet called to remain faithful to the way? First, we need to clarify how we view ourselves. What does it mean to follow the way of the Lord Jesus and to be a member of his own body, the church? As Christians, we understand that the Lord Jesus is our focus, the focus of our lives. Do you understand that, Team Grace? That as a Christian, the Lord Jesus is to be the focus of your life. We have chosen to fan into flame the graces of the sacraments we have received and to follow his way, his way, not our own way, not the way of this fallen world, not the way of our emotions, not the way of ideologies, such as we see this month with the supposed pride celebrations. We do not follow such ideologies. We are Christians. We follow the way of the Lord Jesus. We follow his teachings, his way of life, and his teachings in that way of life are very clear of how we are to live, what we are called to do. Our identity as Christians places us here in the church, the body of Christ. The church cultivates our faith and nurtures a culture of fidelity and holiness. We belong to the church. We are members of the church. It's not that our life is defined by the world and we sometimes just come to mass. We have some Christians like that. They are defined by the world. They are so compromised, they don't even know they're compromised. They have been compromised by the world and they simply just come to mass. But their way of thinking, their understanding of life, the way they approach things, how they act, how they think, how they allow themselves to feel is completely determined by the fallen world. They are sold out, compromised. This is a secular and minimized understanding of discipleship in the life of the church. Well, I can do all that and do whatever I want, but yet still come to mass and somehow think that I'm a faithful Christian. We are defined by the gospel, by the teachings of Jesus Christ and his church. This is who we are. And the various things that we are called to do in the midst of the world, those are the things we do. This is who we are. It's not the reverse. This is what we do, but that's who we are. The choice has to be made, dear friends. Will your hearts, will you allow your hearts to become prey to secular masters and do what they tell you? and you bring that secular message into the house of God? Or will you come here and receive the gospel and take the gospel message out into the secular world? The question is really, what are you carrying? Are you choosing to carry the secular message or the gospel of Jesus Christ? And which of those messages are you allowing to transform and change your heart? As Christians, it should be clear. Our heart belongs to the Lord Jesus. And we receive the gospel and we take that gospel out into the midst of the world. It is who we are as Christians. And the various things we do in the world, those are the things that we just merely do. We do not let them define us. Do you see the difference between the two? What are you carrying? What message are you carrying in your life? Secularism has convinced us that our real lives are out there in the midst of the world. That's the real world. You gotta be thinking in the midst of the real world. That's what secularism tells us. We live in the midst of the world. We do whatever we want. We live however we prefer. Secularism tells us we can live a completely fulfilled life without God. That's a lie. We were made by God and for God. And we will only find our full meaning and our full identity in God. The Lord Jesus makes it clear that real life is, living, is being with him living with him. Yes, we are called to be in the midst of the world as salt, light, and leaven, but as belonging completely to the Lord Jesus. We are to be out there having received the message here so we can take the message there. We are not to be there and be defined by the world and then come and bring that secularism here. We're here in order to receive the gospel. We are then called out in the midst of the world to take the gospel message out in the midst of the world. Yet so many Christians are embarrassed of the gospel. They're ashamed of Jesus Christ, literally love incarnate. They are ashamed. They will not speak the holy name. They will not pray. They will not defend moral truth. And yet they come to this house of worship and somehow in their deluded mind, their compromised heart, they think that they're Christians. No, they are sellouts, wolves in sheep's clothing, 
the worst among us, again being so compromised, they don't even realize that they're compromised. Let me give you an example of how life looks for the Christian when it's off base and inversed in some peculiar secularist way. Discipleship of the gospel is clear. Read the gospels. The Lord is clear what it means to follow him. And yet there are some, perhaps even many, who come to worship but have not yet chosen to follow the way of the Lord Jesus. They come to celebrate the Christian mysteries, to receive even Holy Communion, to be a part of worship, but they do not follow the God they claim to worship. There has not yet been a conversion in their heart where they say, my life for Christ, I will follow his way. Some time ago when I was assigned in Aiken, the parish there in Aiken, a local Baptist minister came up and he was so impressed. He said, you know, I have to tell you something, Father. He said, my, parent, my, parent, my parish, my congregation, we tried to launch a whole program to the unchurched. It was a colossal failure. We just couldn't get the people to come. He said, but you Catholics, you get the unchurched to come to church. So at first I thought it was an anti-Catholic statement. I was like, you better watch it, buddy. <laughs> but that's not what he meant this at all. He said, no, you have people who come to church every weekend who do not believe in Jesus Christ. You literally have the unchurched who come to church. Now, from his perspective, he was identifying what Pope St. John Paul II called the new evangelization. That we have baptized pagans, those who have received the Christian mysteries, the Christian sacraments, but do not think, conduct themselves, or think as Christians. So we have to evangelize our own to understand what it means to be a Christian. So while that perspective is helpful, it also shows our state of affairs. That we have many among us who do not believe. In fact, if we trust Pew Research, we should be cautious about that, but if we're going to trust Pew Research, the majority among us do not believe. Let's just look at the stats. The majority of Catholics do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ. Friends, if Jesus Christ is not God, this is a really bad joke, and you should not be coming here. This is all grounded on the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, God made man. If you do not believe in the divinity of Jesus Christ, you have huge problems in your own discipleship. And of course, the majority of Catholics, we are told, do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Even St. Paul tells us that if the resurrection did not happen, we are the most pitiable of all men. We are fools because this is all grounded on the fact that Jesus bodily rose from the dead, destroying the kingdom of sin and death. The majority of Catholics do not believe, we are told by Pew Research, that Jesus Christ wants a personal relationship with them. I pray that's not true. Do some of you believe that? That Jesus Christ does not want a personal relationship with you. Dear friends, his entire Paschal mystery, his brutal torture, his passion, death, and resurrection was to win credibility in our hearts that we might trust that what he told us was true and that we might walk with him, be on his way, and know that, yes, indeed, he wants a personal relationship with us. The majority of Catholics support abortion. The majority of Catholics support gay marriage. The majority of Catholics, we are now told, up to 70% do not believe in the real presence. Why are you here? This isn't a breadline. If you do not believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ, what, what brings you here? And certainly when we begin to realize if it's true that 70% do not believe in the real presence, it certainly explains why there is such irreverence at Mass and in the house of worship. For if you do not believe that the Lord is among us, then I guess you just can do whatever you think you want. 70% do not believe in the real presence. It is so severe that later this month, the U.S. bishops are declaring a three-year Eucharistic revival. <laughs> the Catholics got a revival going on, okay? <laughs> a three-year revival. Our bishops are addressing this because it is a crisis of faith. 70% of our own do not believe in the real presence. And then, of course, we look at those called the holy matrimony. We are told by statistics that 91% of those called to marriage are using contraception. That's a grave sin. That kills the soul of the person. That kills a marriage. That nurtures selfishness within the very vocation that is to be about selflessness. 
And yet, oftentimes, those who are doing such things approach and receive Holy Communion sacrilegiously, which is a further death through their soul and a weakening of the entire body of Christ. We can continue on, dear friends. We see what happens when there's an inverse. When we allow the secular mindset to take our hearts and our minds, and we begin to think as unbelievers, and we begin to live as unbelievers. This is not the path that we are called to live. We are called actually to commit our lives completely to Jesus Christ. We are to surrender our entire lives to him and to seek to follow his way. As we go, therefore, in the midst of the world, what are our sources? What are our helps to holiness and spiritual health and protection? If we're going to be in the midst of the world and we're trying to keep this secularism and this hedonism and this selfishness out, what's going to protect us? And, of course, the church provides many resources. The Lord provides many resources. The first defense against the extreme efforts of this fallen world to overtake our hearts is the tithe. Yes, you heard that right. The tithe. The tithe. The tithe is a biblical mandate to give our first fruits to the Lord. It is a summons for us to trust in the Lord and to give him the first 10% of our income. Not what's left over after we pay the bills and do whatever we want. Not what we think we should give. It's not based on whether we like or dislike the pastor. <clears throat> the tithe is the first 10% from the top. Why the first 10%? Because it declares our trust in God. It subordinates all other things to God. I will take my very means of livelihood for myself, my family, and I give the first fruits to God because He is Lord. And I will not allow anything, no money, no ideology, no comfort, to rob my heart, to steal my heart from the lordship of Jesus Christ. And that is humbled and kept in check by the tithe. The tithe orders the things of this world according to our faith. It humbles the things of this world and refuses to allow them to overtake our hearts. Whether that's money, possessions, comfort, or ease. St. Paul warns St. Timothy... The love of money is the root of many evils. It is seductive. It lies to us and tells us it gives security and influence. And we buy it. We rarely worship it. Well, I have to take care of myself. I have to take care of my family. I thought you were a Christian. We allow God to take care of us. We give the first fruits to God. And that protects our heart from the fallenness of this world. The first 10%. But well, why not the last 10%? Let me give you an example from the scriptures. Say there was a landowner who had 10 lambs. He didn't know he was going to get 10 lambs. It was a good time. He got 10 lambs. He only had the first lamb immediately. He has one lamb. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And he gives that first 10%, that first lamb to God. He takes it to the temple. He offers it in sacrifice. That is a declaration of faith because he doesn't know what else is coming. My life, my livelihood, everything I am is in God's hands. Jesus Christ is Lord. I believe, I trust. He gives the first lamb. Then he's blessed with nine other lambs. Huh? But if he does the tenth lamb, he has nine other lambs. Where has he put his trust? In God? No, he's put his trust in those other nine lambs. Because he knows, I've got nine other ones waiting for me. I'll give this one to God. Right? That's no sacrifice. That's not the tithe. That is trying to be a businessman and to manipulate and compromise the tithe. No, the tithe is the first 10%. I believe in God. I don't know if other lambs are coming, but I know I have this lamb, and I know that God is good, and I give him my lamb. My lamb. I give him the first 10%. You know, the Old Testament doesn't speak about bringing the tithe. It should be giving the tithe. We use that in English. You've got to give the tithe. Right? But the Hebrew word is actually very different. The Hebrew word actually says you bring the tithe. You don't give the tithe. Do you know why? The Scriptures teach us. You can't give what doesn't belong to you. The tithe doesn't belong to us. We don't give the tithe. We bring the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. Do you know the scriptures tell us that those who do not give the tithe, they steal from God. The scriptures call you thieves. If you do not give the tithe, you have stolen from God. You are a thief. With all the manipulation and the darkness and the lies that go with that. And all the destruction that causes in the spiritual soul and the influence of the fallen world into the heart. The scriptures say the one who does not tithe is a thief. You're in the covenant with God. You declare that you believe in God. You're here because you say you believe in God. But yet you manipulate things in order to trust in yourself. 
to trust in your own wealth, to trust in those nine other lambs. Now, as I explain this, I hope it becomes clear that the tithe is not principally about money, but about faith and trust, obedience and humility to God. I trust in God, and I will order everything else in my life by the tithe. It protects my heart from the fallenness of this world. Now, the money is very helpful, and when it's given to the church, good things happen. Here at Our Lady of Grace, I communicate with utter transparency so you know exactly what's happening. Due because of the tithe of some, we were able to build that home in Greenville for unwed mothers. That's how that got built. Your tithe did that. Right? When we get together for holy fellowship, we don't have to charge for rides and food because your tithe has done that. Right? We're able to serve the poor, those in need, those on the peripheries because of your tithe. But you know who struggles with the tithe? The upper middle class and the wealthy. They're so cheap. Huh? Someone can have a multiple hundred thousand of income and try to convince me that they're poor <laughs> because they compare themselves to the next range, right? to those who have more than them, rather than those who have nothing. Do you know who don't struggle with the tithe? The poor. In fact, if I were to show you some of the poorest families in our parish and show you what they tithe, you would be humiliated. People who work two jobs, single parents, or young families who have three or four jobs between the spouses, and they tithe. They give generously because they haven't put their trust in money. But the upper middle class, the wealthy, oh man, that tithe, huh? They want to hold on to it. No, that's my security. Oh, that's my influence. Huh? They are thieves. Listen to the admonition of the Lord Jesus. It is difficult for the wealthy, and yes, the upper middle class and the upper class, the upper middle class and the high class in this, in this society are the wealthy. The Lord says it is hard for the wealthy to enter paradise. It is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get to heaven because they're cheap, because they're thieves. They steal the tithe. What will happen on the day of judgment when the, such a person stands before the throne and the Lord Jesus asks us, what about all that tithe money that was supposed to be given to help the poor and you never did? What about all that stolen money? What will the soul say to the Lord Jesus at that point? When the Lord shows that soul, this was all the good that I wanted to be done, but could not be done because you stole from me, because you did not offer the tithe. Dear friends, we have to understand, the tithe is a biblical mandate. It is a part of our discipleship. It is a declaration of our trust in God. And we go in the midst of the world. It protects our heart. It puts money in its place. It humbles it, subordinates it. We will not believe its lies. And we have to make sure we give the tithe generously. We have to understand the call that is placed before us. Again, as I explain this, I hope it is clear that the tithe is about our faith and trust. It's not solely about the money. The tithe puts us in our place. And it reminds us that God alone is to be worshipped. And God alone is to be relied upon for our livelihood. But I know that we are fallen. And this is a difficult challenge. And truth be told, many priests do not preach the tithe. You know why? Let me lift the veil. I'm always honest with you, Team Grace. We don't preach the tithe so we don't upset rich people. Because then what happens is when we need big projects, we go to the rich people. And if they can work it in with their tax exemption, they give us large gifts. And then the large gifts is how we do other stuff. So we don't want to upset them and say you have to tithe because we need those large gifts. So let me say today to the rich, keep your large gifts. I refuse to go to hell for your large gifts. And how about we do this instead? We hear the summons of our Christian discipleship, each of us, no matter where we are in terms of our economic status, we hear the call to tithe, to give the 10%. It has been a sin of omission that the shepherds of the church have not preached the tithe. Because without the tithe, we become easy prey to the lies of money and to the lies of the ideology of our world today. And we show a disobedience to a command given to us by God. So again, how else, in addition to the tithe, can we protect our hearts? If the tithe's there, first and foremost, as that kind of guardian around our heart, what else has been given to us? Well, dear friends, the other sources of help that have been given to us are the worthy reception of the sacraments, holy fellowship, and prayer. This is why we have emphasized these throughout the Easter season, in order for you to know the way of life of the Lord Jesus, the way that we are called to follow, the way that you have accepted, 
that you might take advantage of these resources, these helps given, that you might remain strong. For it is a difficult vocation to miss, to live in the midst of the world as a Christian, a secular world, a hedonistic world, a materialistic world, and to remain faithful. In order for us to do that, to keep a fidelity and obedience in our heart, we must rely on the spiritual resources given to us. We must cling to the tithe, seek out the worthy reception of the sacraments, seek holy fellowship with other Christians to encourage us and that we want to encourage and to be a people of prayer. Only in this way can we remain faithful to the way of the Lord Jesus. So this is why, dear friends, as we have gone through the Easter season, I have highlighted all these dis different aspects. And I pray that during the Easter season, as we conclude on this Pentecost Sunday, that in your own discipleship, you have recommitted yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That you understand what it means to lay down your life in order to serve the Lord Jesus. That your life, our lives, are not our own. That they belong to Jesus Christ. Listen to the admonition of St. Paul. Brothers and sisters, I beg you, by the mercies of God, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable to him. Do not be conformed to this world, but allow for the transformation of your minds, that you might know what is good and pleasing and perfect to your Father in heaven. That is our invitation, dear friends. That is the call to every person who dares to call himself or herself a Christian. That is the weight of glory. And to those of us who have said yes and seek to follow the way, we are called to integrity, to an integrity of faith, to do what the Lord has asked and to remain as faithful as we possibly can.